Well, we're continuing with the series uh, as we go through Lent about spiritual disciplines. And today's spiritual discipline is prayer and meditation. Um, Actually, those are two separate ones, but I combine them for today. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis, which you may recognize as the making of the covenant. It's in the 15th chapter. It's where we get the phrase to cut a deal, if you're familiar with such a phrase, where an agreement is made. Um, You've probably heard that. Let's cut a deal. Well, it comes from this particular passage of Scripture. I will pick up in the 15th chapter. It's verses 1 through 12 and 17 through 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall be your descendants. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. When the birds of prey came down on the carcass, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down, and it was dark, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates. Our second reading is from the book of Luke. It is the 13th chapter, verses 31 through 35. It's an interesting passage where Jesus uh, gets a little short with the Pharisees. Uh, It's also a passage of lament, where Jesus laments over Jerusalem. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to him and said, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under a wing, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. It's a funny thing to consider that freedom is found in discipline. Freedom is found in discipline. And we find that in almost all walks of life, that if you want to progress and to be better at something, you have to be disciplined about it. Uh, If you want to learn to play the organ, you have to practice, don't you, David? If you want to learn uh, an instrument, you want to sing, there's practice involved. 
If you want to be great at athletics, then you're going to have to practice. If you're going to excel at schoolwork, well, there's probably some homework to be done. In all of our walks of life, we find what? Discipline is the means that help us become able to move into freedom. For those who don't have discipline, they find their options are often limited. Well, our, our disciplines today are about meditation and prayer. Now, meditation in the Christian tradition is different than meditation in Eastern religious tradition. They're two different things. In Eastern religious tradition, the idea of meditation is to empty yourself so that you can then pursue having non-material being. That is, you want to move yourself away from stuff, you want to move yourself away from owning and being in this world so that you can be set free. Uh, So it's the idea of emptying. The idea in meditation in Christian tradition is filling yourself with God's Word and with Christ. There are two different ideas. One is filling, one is emptying. And so in the Christian tradition, meditation is often used so we become more and more like Christ. We meditate on God's Word, we meditate in prayer, and and, and meditation is a little bit different from prayer because prayer in many ways is also listening and petitioning. Well, in today's scripture, uh, we have the story of Abram before he becomes Abraham, and it intersects with part of my own story. Abraham, I do have to appreciate him, he petitioned God in a broken and hurting place. And he listened and he heard from God. Back in the day when I was working for Bank of America, there was a point in time when I needed to spend some time meditating on God's Word. I have to tell you this kind of long story, but I was working for Bank of America and it was purchased by Nations Bank. We used to joke in those days that you, you should just have a flashing sign so you could just change it without going out front, right? So anyway, we, we were being purchased by another bank, and it was going to take a year for the transaction to close, and during that year, they were not going to tell us whether we had a job or not. You can imagine this effect on morale. So they, they had a solution for this because they were smart enough to realize that nobody was going to stay for a year if you didn't know if you had a job or not. They're, they're at least sharp enough to know that one. So what they offered us was if you stayed through the transition, you kept your portfolio, you did what you were supposed to do, we will give you a six-month bonus of salary at the end of a year. Stick around for a year, we're going to give you an extra six months worth of salary. I was like, well, now you got my attention. Uh, we called them golden handcuffs. Uh, you like that term? You can use it later. It's not mine. So here we sit with golden handcuffs. Well, during that period of time, I was taking care of my portfolio, but I decided to research and find out what do other banks do? How much do they pay their officers? And I began to do an entire research on all of this, which became very fascinating because I met a lot of bankers and a lot of people. And near the end of this process, um, I received one of those offers of a lifetime. Uh, GE Capital came to me and they made me an offer and it made me set up. And I was like, wow, this, this is one of those offers of a lifetime. Oh, and by the way, we want your answer really soon. As in right at the same time, we were supposed to get our check from the bank. Uh, as you can imagine, this made me uncomfortable in life uh, because While GE paid more, I was going from doing credit to doing sales. And I had to do, you refer to it as you eat what you kill. And if you didn't kill anything, guess what? You won't eat. These guys are sharp. You're all over this, right? And, uh, oh, and by the way, if you finish in the bottom 10%, we let those people go every year. But the upside was much larger. So here I was caught between this transition, uh, there was this bonus, there was a lot going, everybody been in one of these places, you just don't know which way to move. And in the midst of all of this, not knowing what to do, which way I should do, and what I ought to all do, I was going to Bible study. And in this Bible study came the story of Abraham and his nephew Lot. 
And in that story, Abraham had gathered and had so much, and Lot had gathered and had so much that they could not feed all of their animals in one place. So Abraham looks to Lot and says, uh, I'll tell you what, we should separate. You take your household, I'll take mine. And here's how we'll divide up the territory. If you decide to go to the left, then I will go to the right. And if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Now, as I read the scripture, I also read that underneath it, it said, and the valley was lush and green and the mountains were not. Now, I've never run cattle, but I'm guessing there's grass involved in that. Right? Sheep, what do you need? Grass. Just, I haven't studied on it, but I'm going to just put my peg right there. You're going to want to go with the green valley. What is up with Abraham? What's he thinking? So as I drove home that night, I had to make the decision because GE was saying, we need to know by Monday. And the year had been up, but GE was kind of, Bank of America was kind of dragging their feet. So I pulled into the driveway and I was sitting in the car and my knuckles had grown white on the steering wheel because I could not make my mind up and I couldn't even get out of the car. You ever been stuck in such a place that I can't make a decision? And it, as I meditated on the Scripture, I began to think, what was Abraham thinking? How could he say, if you go one way, I'll go the other. If you go the other, I'll go the other. You make the decision. And then it occurred to me. He trusted that wherever he went, God would take care of him. It was in that moment of wherever, whatever happens in all of this, God will take care of me. You choose because I know that where I go, God will go and I am going to be fine. In that moment, I decided to take the job. I let go of the steering wheel and I walked in and I was fine. It's in those places of meditation on God's Scripture where God can speak to us. That God will take care. Now, as I read the section on Jesus, it's interesting. He, he runs across a group of Pharisees who appear to be concerned about Jesus' health. Have you noticed this? Uh, there's kind of two options. I'll go over the two options. One is the Pharisees are concerned about Jesus' health. Jesus, we want you to know this Herod guy, which by the way, a threat from Herod is no idle threat. He's already killed John the Baptist. He killed a village full of children. Uh, he's killed some of his own children. We read that outside of Scripture. Uh, this guy is not to be played with. And they go, and, and it could be that they're motivated out of, this is a Jewish brother, we're concerned about you, you might want to move along before Herod catches up with you. That's possible. Or it could be they've hatched a scheme. This is my boat. They've hatched a scheme that let's tell Jesus that Herod knows where you are, and then maybe Jesus will move along and get out of our sandbox because he's messing with all our people. That's a possibility as well. Now, what's great about Jesus' answer is, what does he say? You go tell that fox that I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, so I don't know whether the fox is Herod or whether the fox is the religious teachers. But it's clear that Jesus then turns and talks about the object of what foxes are after, the people. What do foxes do? They eat chickens. And Jesus' heart is breaking for the people. It, when, I, when I read that, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, what's, what's going on in my heart? I can hear Jesus' heart breaking in it. I mean, there's kind of two options. Is Jesus upset with Jerusalem or is he, is he angry with them? Or is his heart breaking around it? And, and I think truthfully, his, his heart is broken because you have all these different teachers, you have uh, political leaders who view the people as something to be eaten, not that that would have anything to do with us today, but there's somebody who got that one. Um, and Jesus' concern is truly the people. 
this past week, I went to a spiritual uh, awakening. It's called The New Door. A friend of mine, J.D. Wald, a spiritual advisor of mine, who was at Asbury, has gathered a group of people, and they came, and we had a conference, and it was on prayer. It was on starting new churches. They had all kinds of different talks. But the most interesting one that I heard was a man who just finished his Ph.D. on the Great Awakenings. If you know what the Great Awakenings are, then you're a church buff. So I'll, I'll go over The Great Awakenings have happened in the United States when Christianity ebbed way low. And then a revival took place and millions of people came to Christ. There's been at least two in the United States. There's one going on in Africa and South America now. Great Awakenings have happened throughout the history of Christianity. In fact, Alex and I, Alex is here today, uh, we took a hike in um, Kentucky, and while we were in Kentucky, there was an area there where people had gotten so concerned about the Christian nation falling apart that they all moved to a mountaintop in the 1800s. They were so concerned that the United States wouldn't be Christian. They moved up there and they lived on their own. Guess what? They're not up there living anymore. Uh, they, they've all moved back off. But the Great Awakenings came through, and as he, read, as he did all the research, he came to this conclusion that every one of them began with prayer. Every great awakening began with prayer. And not the kind of prayer of, oh God, would you mind if you could? Are you all familiar with that kind of prayer? Uh, God, if it's not too much trouble, it was prayer that was driven out of a broken heart. A brokenness for what was going on in the world. A brokenness for what was going on around them. Quakers have a great tradition in being able to preach and teach and pray about a broken world. And as well, they are the most effective in reaching out in such a place. So this prayer out of a deep, broken, concerned heart is where the great awakenings have begun. I've lived here in Crockett now for just a little over four years. It's we're beginning kind of year five here. And I've noticed something, and I, I always fear to say what I notice because I'm still an outsider. I know there's some people who've been here 50 years, and you're still outsiders too, right? So. But it seems as though everybody's not always happy with Crockett and Crockett politics. Am I treading on any toes here? And people are sometimes upset with how things are going in Crockett because they aren't the way they used to be or they're different. Or... And what I've noticed is there's a lot of underlying anger that takes place out of it. A little bit of it in the United States as well as today. Are y'all feeling me? Or is, am, am I Okay, y'all are with I see some nods. Y'all don't have to raise your hands, please. And I hear... Anger, but I don't hear broken hearts. You see, I think out of broken hearts come a real change. Not out of anger. And as I said earlier, I see it in today's politics. I see it in today's world. But the great awakening starts in ourselves when we move out of a brokenness and a brokenness of our hearts. If you want to see a great awakening, let it start in me. Let it start in our own brokenness. And then maybe we can help a broken world. Well, I started with the first story, and I probably should finish it. I did go into work the next morning. I showed up with full intent on turning my resignation in. Uh, I walked into the door and was ready, and I received a call from somebody who did the same job I did in Dallas. He called me, he says, Patrick, don't quit this morning. I was thinking, <laughs> did you open my mail? Or he said, there's a meeting at 10 o'clock, and you're going to probably want to attend it. It's about 8.30 in the morning. I said, okay, I'll be there at that meeting. And at 10 o'clock that morning, I walked in on a Friday, and they said, Today, we are going to pay you your bonus for staying. Today, we're going to pay you that. 
And then, as you get the idea, I resigned. What was amazing to me about the story, what was amazing to me about this moment, was that not that my meditation, because, because I think about these things, not that my meditation, not that my prayers changed at all what was going to happen, but what it did do was it gave me the peace of God. It gave me the peace of God. Why we should not be afraid is because God is with us. God will take care of us. In the end, that is the answer. All, all too often we are worried about all the wrong things. We are concerned about too many things. And we forget that if we go left or if we go right, if we go with God, we are just fine. My reward wasn't the pay. I came to understand that my reward was God. My reward was in the certainty of Him being with me. My prayer for you is that may you meditate and hear from God and in every step. Know that He is with you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.